Welcome back to um, ELE 210 circuit theory. Um, we're talking about diodes and bipolar junction transistors. Um, and so I thought I'd do a quick review of things we mentioned in um, ELE 115 um, and maybe expound a little bit, but um, because we're talking about bipolar junction transistors and we're doing it without getting really deep into the circuits. There's a, you know, just about a career you could spend there um, as they have <clears throat> um, evolved the, uh, the NPN transistor and PNP transistor for that matter. And, and MOSFETs have appeared and JFETs have appeared and there's microwave devices that um, do all sorts of fancy things. And so I um, just want to talk about the basic um, bipolar junction transistor and um, kind of review it so that you, you know, because it's, it's used in so many circuits and when you see it, um, I just want you to have an idea of, 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 of how it works, you know, how you turn it on to conduct, how you turn it off, maybe how it's at, uh, used as an amplifier. And so I start out with this um, diagram. You remember the PN junction diode. Um, it's often built using crystalline material. Um, well, it's built using crystalline materials, and often it's silicon. And um, they'll do a manufacturing process where they wind up with um, silicon material that's that's doped. That is, impurities are driven into it, um, so that uh, you know some of the material is. Uh, has impurities from column three in the periodic table. Silicon comes from column four. And all the silicon atoms have four electrons in their outer shell with four uh, spaces for more electrons, it, you know, it, it, if, they, if they could uh, be there. Um, obviously, silicon has a certain number of protons in the nucleus, and the number of electrons and, and protons want to be equal. Um, certainly in the long term, and, uh, and, and, and so that, that's the way materials work. So what happens in this p-type material and in this n-type material, it's still charge neutral. There's the same number of electrons and, and protons, but what happens is uh, impurity atoms are driven into the, um, into the silicon um, that come from, say, uh, column three in the periodic table and those materials they come in and they uh, you know they actually bond in, in the in the silicon lattice and take up spots in the silicon lattice and um, they form uh, places where there's only three electrons in the outer shell and of course there's one less proton in the in the nucleus to, to keep that balance but for a passing electron, um, they look like a, kind of a, a place where an electron might jump to um, more so than if it was just pure silicon. Pure intrinsic silicon is, uh, al almost, a, uh, is, is almost an insula insulator. But this, is, uh, this stuff's called a semiconductor because if you uh, finesse it, right, you can get it to conduct some. Um, the cathode side is the same kind of thing. Atoms are driven into it from a material in column five of the periodic table. And so these, these materials have five electrons in the outer shell. And of course they have an extra proton in the nucleus. So that uh, these guys, you know, to the untrained eye, it looks like there's uh, extra electrons to flow over here. And on the positive side, it looks like there's extra sites for electrons. Some people call these holes. You have electrons and holes. But we don't need to get into all, all of that, how it works. But we do know that conventional current will flow forward through a diode. And uh, it won't flow backwards through the diode, um, although you can get a little tiny bit of, of current to flow back there due to, you know, thermal energy and, and, and things, you know, breaking the rules and getting through, but um, pretty much uh, no current going backwards. It's, it's um, very small current, let's put that, ex ex exceedingly small current. 
Um, it's actually used in photodiodes in that way. They do have current that goes backwards, and when, elect and when photons hit a photodiode, they help uh, some of the electrons break the rules and conduct in the wrong direction, and um, that's how photodiodes detect light. Um, so energy is used in order to get the electrons to go the wrong way in photodiodes, but um, for us, we use junction diodes uh, it, it, you know, in an attempt to steer current in one direction. Um, the NPN BJT you know, has three uh, crystalline regions in it that are brought together in some way. This doesn't represent exactly how it would be constructed, but it gives some hints. And uh, we have N-type material in the collector and N-type material in the emitter and P-type material in the base. And so it's a little different here, but the, this is the base, that's the collector, this is the emitter. The base to emitter junction is a kind of PN junction right there. And when you, uh, when you forward bias that and get a little bit of current to flow, um, a process happens where um, current will uh, flow from the collector across the base to the emitter and, um, and, and it will flow uh, in, in, a, in a ratio to whatever's in the base current, uh, whatever's in the base, fl flowing through the base and we will sometimes refer to that as beta, the, the ratio of the collector current by the, uh, by the base current. We in ELE 115 called that the DC beta, and then if you if you looked at it more from the standpoint of change in collector current over change in base current, um, that would be the AC beta. But we'll just call it beta for now. Those numbers are, uh, you know, blur your eyes a little bit. They're roughly equal. Uh, but remembering that beta is kind of the current gain in the transistor. That's that's a uh, that's as, that's as fine as we need to get in, in our work. So I'm going to go um, bring up an, oh, no, no, not that. I'm going to bring up another um, window here. So that's our transistor. And let's take a look at this little simulation I did here. I was not able to do this in easy EDA. There are some limitations and features which are maybe one can cause them to happen. I wasn't able to, and I didn't want to fool with it too long. But what you can see here is I have a voltage source connected through a resistor to the base of an NPN transistor. I'm using LT Spice here as the simulator. It's free, you can get it. Um, with a little bit of fooling around, you can begin to learn to use it. It's, uh, you know, the way you, connect schematics and, and uh, things is a little bit different than Easy EDA, although Easy EDA is using LT Spice underneath the covers. So, um, but that being said, what I did is I put in a piecewise linear uh, voltage source. It stays at zero volts for one millisecond. It ramps to two volts during the next 10 milliseconds and then remains at two volts for like another five milliseconds or so. And so um, what I do here is I'm just ramping the base current to take this transistor from being uh, cut off through the linear or active region and then uh, turn it on so much it actually goes into what we call saturation. And the idea here is just to talk about the three modes that a transistor can operate in. Um, first of all, it, so if we look here, I can make this a little bigger. I, I, I think you get the idea of that thing. We can refer back to it if we need to. Um, so we start off we can see that the uh, the voltage V1 that drives this thing stays at zero for a millisecond. Then it starts this 10 millisecond ramp. That's V in, and then it stays at uh, it goes up to two volts and stays there. All right, there's two volts right there. Well, at some point in time, um, the voltage on the the base of uh, the transistor. 
um, will reach, you know, they're showing since very little current is flowing, that means almost no voltage is dropped across to R1. So in the early parts of this, the base voltage is the same as V1. And as the base voltage builds up and approaches our magic number of 0.7 volts, we can see that um, the uh, base current, which is this uh, red guy here, the, the pink is the, um, is the base voltage. As the base voltage starts to get up here a little bit over 0.5 volts, I don't know if you can see it or not, but there's sort of a curve here the base current starts to creep up and it doesn't take much base current for this thing to start causing a lot of collector current this orange here is the collector current and it starts taking off and so we move from the cutoff region in this cutoff region little or no collector current flows and the transistor is considered off <clears throat> you could argue that the cutoff region uh, you know, ends right about here where the collector current um, uh, starts to, to take off from the curve. But I, I drew it over here where, we, where the transistor starts to reach up into the 0.7 volts from base to emitter. Um, and the reason I did that is the next region, it looks small here. Uh, this next region is, this is the active or linear region. In this region, uh, the change in collector current, IC, divided by the change in IB equals beta. We we'll call that beta AC again, let's not quibble. And the base emitter junction is forward biased because the base voltage is greater than the emitter voltage. In our circuit, the emitter voltage is zero. The base voltage is starting to take off now. So we definitely have a forward biased base emitter junction and uh, we have a reverse biased uh, collector base um, junction. And let's just talk about that for a second. If I bring, let's see, did I close that thing or uh, just going to bring my transistor uh, diagram back here. I don't know. Uh, I guess I... Here's my diagram. So this guy is turned on, the base emitter junction. I've got a positive voltage here, and this is at ground. So I'm starting to forward bias this junction here. But this voltage here, I've got a high voltage on the N, and, um, and still it's pretty low voltage on the P, so this is reverse bias. And that is the way it works in the, um, in the linear region. In cutoff, this base emitter junction just isn't getting enough current to cause anything to happen current-wise, or very little. So we call that cutoff because there's no current flowing in the collector emitter circuit. But when the base current gets high enough, I start to get some current to flow. But the collector voltage is still, let me put this down here, the collector voltage is still set up by, say, this 5-volt power supply that collector voltage is still higher than the base voltage. And so, love it. There it is. Um, so this guy here with a high voltage on the N and uh, still pretty low voltage on the P, that's reverse biased. So in the, in the linear region, that's your, your characteristic is forward biased on the base emitter, reverse biased on the collector base. Okay. And you would find that in the 111 notes, or one, I'm sorry, the, the ELE 115 notes. So now we're into this linear region, and, and it's a small region, but we can do a lot in there. You see we've got a little curve here, and then we got a very steep curve here. And that's, um, you know, between these two dotted vertical lines, that's an area where things are proportional and we can build amplifiers where we wiggle an input and the output wiggle is bigger. And, um, and we do that. 
the thing is, once we get, um, once V in gets up here, see Q1 base hits V equals 0.8 volts. Well, as we start to get close to that, you can see that the collector current says, hey, I, I just can't turn this thing on anymore. I'm reaching a maximum value. And when you think about it, if you pretend that this collector to emitter thing is shorted, 5 volts, 10K, that would be one half of a milliamp flow in there. And um, you can see it up here, there's 0.5 milliamps, and we've got just a whisker under it. But that's where we are. The transistor is essentially closing this switch as hard as it can. One thing about BJTs is they can't close the switch as well as MOSFETs can. They can close it pretty well, but uh, our MOSFETs can really get this, uh, uh, it's called a drain and a source in a MOSFET. They can get this down to, down to where it's essentially a few thousandths of an ohm effectively. And so that's why you see these very efficient switching devices, switching power supplies, motor controls, uh, whatever. But the fact that MOSFETs can, can turn that um, channel on into so good and, and with such low resistance makes them actually favored over BJTs for switches. Um, but BJTs, they're just not going away. They're hanging around. They're used for a lot of things. Um, and they're easy to use, and they're, and they're usually pretty robust, too. Um, so, um, now, we've gone from a cutoff region where we just don't have enough base emitter voltage to do anything. We've gone up to where the base emitter voltage is now um, high enough that we're getting a proportional uh, behavior between the base current, the red curve here that's got a little bit of curve to it, and the orange collector curve, which has got a lot of curve to it. Okay, and um, and and it, but eventually the base emitter junction becomes so turned on that the transistor says, "I, I just don't, you know, uh, uh, my pipe is full. I cannot uh, ram more water through this this valve, if you will. Think of it as a valve." And so the collector current reaches um, its max. When you're in this region, this is the saturation region. So we have three regions, really, cutoff, active, and saturation. And even MOSFETs have this behavior, although I think they use different names in, in, a, in a MOSFET going back to the device physics and all that. <clears throat> but a lot of active devices have this behavior. Nothing proportional or some kind of controllable region and then just totally turned on um, region. And uh, so if you want to amplify a signal, then you want to set up your circuit so that your BJT is in this region. The base current is is such that it's, you know, stays in, in uh, this, this, this region here where the, the red is. You know, it doesn't take too much base current, you'll be out of this region, and if you cut the base current off altogether, you'll be in cutoff. So that's the linear or active kind of application where you're amplifying something or proportionally controlling something. Um, the other kind of application is, is switching, where you either cut the thing off or saturate it. You know, you can turn on an LED with a transit. You, you can do it with a microcontroller, but in that microcontroller is a is a is a MOSFET transistor. You know, a, a, a equivalent of a BJT, but in a MOSFET form, and it goes between cutoff and saturation. You, it, it's just on or off. And you know, for digital type things, on and off are two great states, and you can do a lot of work with it. You can do things like. Um, pulse width modulation where you, you you cut off the transistor, there's no power dissipated then, or you put the transistor into saturation, in which case um, there's a lot of current going through it, but not much voltage on the collector. See what happens to the collector here? There's no current in the collector in cutoff. There's voltage, but no current. So there's zero power dissipated there. Then you go over into saturation and the collector voltage goes down so low, there's zero volts. This is, uh, you know, I think this is probably below 0.1 volts right here. And so uh, there's very low voltage here. So there is some power dissipation, but it's still pretty low. 
and with a MOSFET, this this goes even lower. So with MOSFETs, you have this idea of there's no power dissipation when they're off, just like bipolar or junction transistors. And when they're on, there's even less power dissipation than there are with bipolar junction transistors. In either case, switching becomes this interesting thing because you say, look, if if I t turn the circuit totally on or totally off, my switch device doesn't dissipate much power. And if you think about that, think about a copper switch. When it's open, no current, no power can be uh, dissipated. When it's closed, it's a piece of copper and you know the the resistance is so low you just don't create much heat in the in the copper blade of the switch and so you can put a lot of current through it and and you can switch a lot of power if you will um, that way the same thing can be done with mosfets and you know to an okay extent uh, bjt's bipolar junction transistors so hopefully that explains the uh, cutoff um, linear or active and saturation regions. Cutoff and saturation are great for switching when you're going to do everything where it's totally off and totally on. The linear region is meant for proportional control, which is you know what amplification is. The other thing I was going to say, you know, if you're if you're running a, a motor or something like that, so um, a, a motor switching circuits used to use bipolar junction transistors. Now they're going to MOSFETs. But um, the idea is if I want the motor to run at, you know, about half the energy, I could turn this transistor on half the time and turn it off the other half the time. And, you know, the motor's magnetism and everything, if I do that fast enough, the motor will kind of feel like it's getting maybe half the energy that it normally does electrically and run it, you know, half the speed. Now, that, that, that may not be a linear thing. Um, it may run at a third of the speed, you know, and you may have to fool with that um, pulse width modulation, as they call it. But it's a way to control motors. I think you guys did it in um, uh, with the Spark Fun Inventors Kit in ELE 115, and you were able to, uh, you know, uh, change the width of pulses and that sort of thing to uh, to drive the uh, to, to drive the motor faster or slower. So, all right. Um, that is basically our uh, discussion on um, the basic modes in a, in a BJT. And from that, uh, you know, I, I, you can see that I've kind of set it up to say that MOSFETs, you know, we really don't do that much in the linear region. We love MOSFETs for cutoff and saturation. So, um, all right, until next time, um, take it easy, and we will see you soon. Bye.